In this video, we'll see how to import our exported real-time data files into Data Assist, how to enter setup information, and how to adjust a few critical analysis parameters. Let's start with importing the files we exported in the last section. If the software isn't open already, double-click on the icon for Data Assist. Next, go to File, New. This opens a new Study dialog box. Enter a unique name and, optionally, a description of the study. Now, add files. I previously exported the results from a study in the 7900 RQ Manager software that contained a Delta Delta CT file. I'll navigate to where I saved that file, select it, and hit Open. If I wanted, I could also add additional exported study files, and all the data would be combined into a single file. In this case, though, I'll just click OK. At this point, we need to do some labeling. Now, as you can see, certain information gets carried over from the exported real-time files, including sample and assay names. Other information, however, such as the reference sample and the endogenous control, needs to be designated within Data Assist. I'll start with the endogenous control. If I know already which gene is expressed in a stable manner across all of my samples, I can go here under Type and change the selection for that assay from Target to Selected Control. But let's say that I don't know yet which gene is most stable. In fact, this is an experiment to determine that. The run I just imported is not a typical gene expression experiment. This example is actually a pre-made TACMAN array product known as the Human Endogenous Control Card, which is a 384 well format that comes spotted with 16 commonly used endogenous control assays. The idea is that I can load equal amounts of eight different samples, say four untreated and four treated samples, and test the stability of all 16 genes in my sample cohort. I can then have Data Assist figure out from the data which gene I should use in the future as my normalizer for this same set of sample types and experimental conditions. To do this, I'm going to change the type for each of the 16 assays to candidate control. Because this may seem a bit cumbersome, I'd like to quickly mention an alternate way to enter assay and assay type information. As described in Appendix A of the User Manual, one can import a .txt or .csv assay design file containing this information into Data Assist. Similarly, a sample design file can be used to enter sample names and biological groupings. Let's go back to our endogenous control plate. Now that every gene is designated a candidate control, I'll click on the binocular symbol next to Select Endogenous Controls for Analysis. A chart comes up showing the stability in CT for all eight samples. Each assay also receives a score based on variation of that gene compared to that for all other candidate controls. The lower the number, the more stable the gene is in my samples. It looks like beta-actin and beta-2 microglobulin are most stable. One important note, in order to get meaningful scores using the built-in GeneNorm algorithm, I need to test at least three candidate endogenous controls. If this were a regular gene expression experiment with, say, oh, only two candidate controls and one or more target genes, as I have in this example, I could now switch one candidate gene to selected control, say beta-actin, and omit the second candidate control by clicking here, easily removing the data from consideration. Well, let's work from this example for a while, since it provides a nice illustration of an exported study file containing multiple delta-delta CT plates. We're looking at three target genes, plus our normalizer, beta-actin. A few things we need to do before proceeding. First, you'll notice that the samples fall into two types, brain and heart. What I have are four biological replicates of each type. I want to label those appropriately, such that the software will perform statistics on the groups rather than just on my individual samples. I label them by clicking in the first blank space under Group and entering a group name, brain, say. Now, I can use a pull-down menu option for the next three biological replicates. I'll also do this for heart. 
And just to reiterate, I could also make these assignments by importing a sample design file as described in Appendix A. Let's take a look under Analysis Settings. We see quite a few parameters that can be changed, such as the CT cutoff. The default is 40, but most users will want to set this value lower. My recommendation is to set it just before the point in the reaction when the precision of your technical replicates starts to become unacceptably high, a phenomenon we almost always see during the later cycles of real-time PCR. For those of you who might be newer to the technology, I'll quickly explain why this happens. Let's say I were to generate a simple dilution curve in real time, in which I run multiple replicates of each dilution point. I pipette carefully, so all the points on my curve give pretty tight data, except for the most dilute point. The variation we're seeing is probably not due to sloppy pipetting. More likely, it's caused by the Poisson distribution, a statistical term describing the stochastic variation that occurs at low concentrations of target. Here's how it works. Pretend we have a very dilute solution, only 9 molecules and 30 microliters of liquid. Now, I'm going to aliquot this solution just as I would when, say, creating identical replicates in real time. And pretend that from a volumetric standpoint, my pipetting is perfect such that I can dispense 10, 10, and 10 microliters with no error. The question is, how often do I end up with exactly three molecules in my replicate tubes? Well, according to Poisson, not very often. Most of the time, the distribution of molecules is irregular. The same thing happens to real-time reactions. Replicate amplification curves that show up late in the run often have poor precision making full change data for these samples a bit suspect.